This is Brother Ron, and welcome to We All Be News Radio and TV, the news free Dixie for the 21st century. Boys and girls, scholars and laymen, and welcome to another wonderful edition of the Artivist Reviews. Now, I'm very excited about this, boys and girls, scholars and laymen, ladies and gents. Uh, I'm reviewing Brother Aaron Ramsey's recent black sci fi masterpiece, The Aware Negro. Y'all gotta check this book out, y'all, because I know a lot of people have been talking about. Uh, the Bright movie, uh, the movie Get Out, uh, Get Out, Get Out, that movie Get Out. Um, so many things happening right now. And uh, I want to tell you all that black science fiction is the way to go right now. And brother Aaron Ramsey, he's on that uh, Vanguard right now uh, with his book, The Wear Negro, which is a very fascinating read. It's a very quick read. It's a quick read because it's a very fascinating and intriguing and engaging read. And um, I'm going to give you all the synopsis of the book. And then I'm going to give you my review of the book. Okay, here's the synopsis or the summary of The Wear Negro. Spencer Packer is a liberal white man from the Midwest. He was taught to judge people not based off of their race and color, but off of their actions, or so he believes. After a brutal attack by a monstrous were Negro, <laughs> by a monstrous Negro, his beliefs are tested and his life is changed forever. During the full moon, he transforms into the were Negro. Is this a curse or a blessing? As he learns to control his out of control Negro counterpart, he exposes a conspiracy with galactic proportions involving melanin, shadow governments, and aliens. Welcome to the Melanin Harvest. Yes, the world, ne the world Negro is available on Amazon.com. Brother Aaron Ramsey's is the author. I ran into Brother Ramsey's at uh, Baba Dick Gregory's homecoming Mother's Day comedy show in St. Louis. You can sometimes find me in St. Louis in misery. Uh, he actually intended a book for Baba Gregory, but you know, for whatever reason, the Universal God selected me to receive his gift, and I was not disappointed. Uh, by the read I was not disappointed by the read like I said this to me in my humble opinion this book is like our generation like the millennial version of the spook who sat by the door yeah, I think it's on that level this could be the spook who sat by the door uh, great read which is interesting because Sam Greenlee is from Chicago and brother Ramsey has roots in Chicago and the book, the brother, like the, the, the protagonist is a white guy from a liberal Midwest. He's actually from the St. Louis, Missouri area. And I'm very familiar with St. Louis. As a lot of people are right now for the last three or four years, actually, St. Louis has been the epicenter of, of black power, of, of protests, of uh, riots, of uh, uh, revolution in uh, embryo stages. 
with the Mike Brown and Ferguson situation going on there. Um, but also with the book, I think it, it has a very sophisticated way of dealing with issues of so-called white supremacy. I call it white inferiority. Uh, when I read the book, it reminds me of a uh, you know watermelon man actually watermelon man with the uh, late comic Godfrey C Cambridge or Godfrey Cambridge I believe is a black comedian name who plays a white man who, who transformed into a black man overnight and his worldview is kind of shaped by that uh, but I will say this the book touched on a lot of issues that are very relevant uh that has been relevant for a while with black people and with america and it does so in a very unique way nothing is taboo in the book it deals with a lot of different things and i don't want to give the book away too much i just think that um it should be read and i can see this book easily being translated into a movie or a comic book or to other things uh, it reminds me also of Twilight, you know, that movie that made a lot of money or the book series. They talk about the white girl infatuation with the uh, werewolf man, Wolfman and uh, the vampires. And it was translated to a movie. This could be made into a series, I believe, uh, of books as well as movies. But I, I'm looking forward to more reads from uh, brother Aaron Ramsey's. As it relates to the word Negro, because you say he's going to make more uh, books and even a comic book pertaining to it. And uh, I would like to ask the question, I mean, like, you know, what's interesting with white supremacy racism? Like we are right now, this is around MLK Memorial uh, weekend or Dr. King holiday weekend. Uh, also, we're approaching the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King, uh, January the 18th. Uh, March the 57th anniversary of the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, who was the first prime minister of the Congo, who was killed uh, with the help of Belgians, the CIA and probably British intelligence. They uh, made sure that his body was effectively destroyed, uh, mutilated, destroyed, you know, so there's no burial ground or burial place, uh, place of, of where people could go and pay their respects to Patrice Lumumba. But the thing about it is, I thought it was interesting, I saw a documentary recently about the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. And one of the people who were involved in the assassination, this Belgian uh, military guy, military intelligence, he actually had in his possession two of Patrice Lumumba's front teeth. And he was happy about it. And he was like, oh, yeah, oh, ha, 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 I got it. Oh, I got gold. Oh, they, he had good teeth. This is very macabre. But there is the white people's fascination with black folks' body parts. I remember when I went uh, down to Southampton, Virginia, uh, two years ago, after the Nat Turner Birth of a Nation movie came out, I went down to the birthplace of Nat Turner. And I talked to the guy who was the county clerk down there. His family, he's descended from folks who were victims and survivors of the Nat Turner Rebellion back in 1831. And so he talks about, like, they actually have Nat Turner's actual sword at the county uh, office. Uh, they won't let anybody see it. Uh, he talked about how people... Uh, when they killed Nat Turner, they stripped, you know, they ripped his body apart into bits and pieces. They actually made furniture out of Nat Turner's body parts, wallets, furniture. Uh, they even kept his skull. They destroyed the rest of his body, but they kept his skull as an heirloom. I mean, it was passed down from generation to generation. Then my understanding, the family finally got possession of the skull back in uh, late 2016 right after the movie came out or around the time the movie came out and so they gave it a, a proper burial but you know it doesn't surprise me look at lynchings um where they will like lynch black men and women and they'll cut off the body parts of these people and keep them as keepsakes or sell them in stores like it was like you know you go into kroger's or walmart buying groceries or 
a PlayStation or something. I mean, they actually will cut up body pe body parts from black folks and sell them and make postcards out of the photographs. And, you know, they talk about skulls and bones with Yale. Um, well, they actually said that Geronimo Skull, the famous uh, Native American warrior and revolutionary, that his skull is actually kept at Skull and Bones up in Yale. The Skull of Bones also, you know, that's the place where a lot of these presidents come out of, like William Howard Taft and the Bushes and Bill Clinton and all these so-called powerful Illuminati folks, secret society stuff. But well, I say all this to say that uh, white folks sure do got a funny imagination, a weird way of showing respect for those who they claim to hate. Uh, I, you know, I, I went on Dr. King. Dr. King, I mean, they, it, 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 Dr. King is like a fetish for white supremacy, for white inferiority. It's like a fetish thing. They gave him a Nobel Prize, you know. They made him a celebrity, uh, the leader of black people, the spokesperson for black America. Then towards the end, they destroyed his, his platform. They destroyed his credibility, the powers that be, because... Like he said himself, what good is it to sit at the restaurant and can't afford to pay for the hamburger? So he started talking about redistribution of wealth. He started talking about uh, United States foreign policy, war, Vietnam, getting out of Vietnam. Uh, just being like, you know, getting himself in a place to be the first black person to be in a position to affect U.S. public policy. And not to be able to be controlled by the so-called puppet masters of U.S. public policy was a problem. So he had to go. But once they got rid of the man, they could remake him in a myth that was compliant to the American capitalist view. So yeah, Dr. King is very much fetishized by this system. I mean, you got streets named after him, schools, you know, holiday or hella day, whatever you want to call it. But the thing about it is that the real man has been buried underneath all the bullshit. The real mission. And what makes it crazy is that it's really readily available. But it's really inaccessible. Not because it's not available, but because the way we have been programmed to not be able to receive. Or to be able to understand and dissect and analyze and build upon it. You know, because... In the insane asylum, when the inmates run the asylum, the person who questions the authority is the crazy one. If the inmates are the authorities of the asylum, then the, the person who's saying who questions that authority is labeled by that system, by the asylum as being the crazy, deranged one. So this is how it, it feels to be a so-called woke person in a sleeping giant. But anyhow, uh, black people in general are like fetish things for white supremacy, racism. And you look at the word Negro, you got white men who transform into big super black men, you know. And the thing about it is the white man's imagination, how he perceives black people is addressed in the word Negro in a very interesting way because the word Negro, when uh, Spencer Packer, you know, the, the lead character, like he is, his best friends are black people. The woman that he's in love with is a black co-worker. Uh, his best friend growing up, even though he came from a very affluent white uh, suburban community, was a black dude. But And his roommate, at the beginning, his roommate was kind of like a, some type of Italian-American character from a Spike Lee movie, which I was very interesting. Um, but like Spencer Packer's uh, perception of black people is a unique thing in the book as well, and how it takes a transformation. Because I don't know how white folks say, oh, I got black friends. My best friend are Negroes. And to me, like when people say that, it's like basically you said, hey, I'm very much aware 
of how this person looks and how this person is perceived by my society. It's really not about the character. Because, like, why is it a big deal to have a black friend or to have a so-called white friend? But it's more importantly, as I learn, I get older, to be comfortable in your own skin, to accept yourself. Because I hear people all the time, they talk about how, I mean, I met people. When you classify as white people, I heard a white woman tell me one time, that, hey, I don't date white guys. And I'm saying to myself, even if you prefer black men or other men who are not white, I wouldn't say that per se. Why is that? Like, why are you dismissive of your own kind? White women create white men. So why does she, I mean, that's a form of self-hatred to me, but that's another story. But um, you hate the thing that you help you to produce. Uh, I mean, this, I know I'm all over the place, but I'm just thinking about this because this book raised a lot of interesting points about self-acceptance, self-love, self-hate, uh, the hate that hate produce. I think it's probably fascinating. Uh, it's kind of like, there's a saying, you are what you eat, right? Well, you are what you consume. You know, and you look at culture. You know, pop culture especially. Um, the history of culture in America. The history of race and racism in America. And culture goes hand in hand. It does. It really does. You look at the history of blackface. You think about... Uh, Thomas Daddy Rice, T.D. Rice, the founder of the Minstrel Show, Minstrel Show, Blackface. Think about the great comedian, Burt Williams, who was a black man who, who needed to, or he felt the need to dress up in blackface to be successful in a white, racist, entertainment industry complex. As brilliant as he was, he felt the need to cork up his face in order to be accepted, but he never was accepted. If you read him, I mean, he, like W.C. Fields, the, the famous comedian, a friend of Burt Williams once said, he said he's the funniest man he ever saw, but the saddest man he ever knew. The funniest man he ever saw, but the saddest man he ever knew. I said, what the hell? Y'all, you rambling, but no, I'm not really rambling, but I just want y'all to check out the book. Read it and support it. You know, because I think that brother Aaron Ramsey's is uh, a voice of our generation and that this book needs to be needs to be read and appreciated for what it is uh, i'm glad that i got a chance to run into the brother at baba gregory's show which was actually the best show i've ever seen baba you know baba gregory do and i wish it was recorded because he was in rare form and uh so it was definitely a great opportunity to meet this brother and i look forward to reading more things from him. The Wear Negro is available at Amazon.com.